Hey friends, welcome to the Publish, Promote, Profit podcast. I'm Rob Kosberg, and every week I show you how to use a best-selling book to grow your income and your impact. And if you're interested in having your own best-selling book, I recorded a short video explaining our trademarked process at beginmybook.com. All right. Hey, welcome everybody. It's Rob here with the Publish Pro Profit Podcast. Excited to be with you today. I got a great guest uh, who was great to reconnect with, a former client of ours. Jennifer Eggers is the president of Lead Shift Insights. She works with leaders and organizations facing disruptive change, and there certainly is plenty of that these days in the market, especially those who want to increase their capacity to adapt. Uh, Jennifer's been a a coach uh, at the sea level for nearly 30 years. She's coached entire leadership teams as well as officers and directors of many Fortune 500 companies. Her best-selling book is The uh, Resilience, It's Not About Bouncing Back, How Leaders and Organizations Can Build Resilience Before Disruption Hits. That book became an international bestseller and has done some really great things for uh, Jennifer's business and, uh, of course, is a great purchase for people that are, are in that marketplace. She's a strategic partner with the University of Georgia, an advanced uh, practitioner in adaptive leadership, uh, a member of the Adaptive Leadership Network at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, but she's not a lover of those universities uh, because she is a Penn State Nittany Lion <laughs> But of course, she'll work and, and help those folks out uh, as needed. So Jennifer, <laughs> great to reconnect with you. <laughs> what a way to start. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, what the heck? I mean, I, I, I looked at all your bio. I saw your scuba diving stuff. I saw all your cool stuff. And I'm like, I got to say something about, you know, Jennifer working with Georgia and Harvard, but she's really a lover of Penn State. So <laughs> Absolutely. You know, that <laughs> those roots run deep, bro. They run deep. That's right. That's right. It's great to have you on. We were obviously talking a, a few minutes ago. Before we dive into the book and and um, the marketplace and whatnot, why don't you like tell me, tell our audience who it is you serve, what it is you do, kind of your magic in the marketplace? Yeah, thank you. So I would say primarily we work with leaders and teams who are going through disruption, and our goal is really to help improve their capacity to adapt. Uh, And we do that so they can emerge from the disruption stronger and faster and more effective than they were when the disruption hit. And so uh, I would say the majority of our clients from a coaching standpoint are uh, C-suite, maybe one level down. When we think about, you know, some of our workshops, we so we do coaching workshops and a lot of uh, facilitation and consulting. I would say um, our coaching is mostly SVP and above. Our workshops go, we can do frontline all the way to the C-suite. I would say right now, most of them are leadership teams. We've been focused on helping leadership teams really demonstrate a collective visible leadership um, as a team this year. It seems to be where the need has been. So that's kind of where we've met the market this year. Yeah. And then from a facilitation standpoint, we facilitate what I call high stakes meetings, usually for leadership teams and often at the board level as well as boards and management teams kind of come together to really figure out how to reinvent and reinvigorate, you know, after the pandemic and moving forward now. Love it. You know, I I would say uh, as far as what you do, uh, disruptive change is like, I mean, it's almost like that's all that's going on right in the marketplace from, (laughs) you know, big companies uh, like Boeing or the airlines when, when the pandemic hit Mm. or, uh, you know, the, the issues with the travel industry and the hospitality industry, et cetera. So besides all of those like obvious things, like give me some specifics about what disruptive change looks like for these businesses, these companies. Gosh, I mean, it could be anything. I've got one client that, you know, really is um, re- a lot of times it's restructuring. So, okay. you know, they, we started working with them and actually the book was largely responsible for this client, but they, you know, we started as they were um, mandated from, it was a, a business unit. It was part of a larger organization that was mandated to really restructure um, and rethink, move some things over to corporate. And, you know, they were really struggling with how to do that. So the business started in the restructuring space. It's not exactly the majority of what we do anymore, but we certainly helped them kind of get through that restructuring. But then, you know, once you get through it, then it's like, then what? You know, then we have to deal with what we've got. And so at right around that time, um, COVID hit 
And so now we've got to deal with, you know, half the companies working from home and, you know, that became then half the companies coming back. Right. So how do we deal with that? Right. Um, you know, for some companies, one client was, you know, many, well, several actually setting up new centers of excellence. So one manufacturing consumer products company that we work with started a, a revenue growth management center of excellence. And so that concept was very new to the company, the executive that brought it in, you know, some welcomed her, some really didn't think they needed it. How do we set her up for success and really get the, um, the value out of that function? And so yeah. we've, we've done a lot of that. I have one coaching client that is incubating a new product. She started an incubator in an organization that's, you know, pretty stodgy, pretty, pretty tough to get things done in this place. And so they wanted to isolate this incubator where they could really be a little more entrepreneurial. And so that's kind of been a fun one to help her sort of cool. figure out how to navigate that. So, you know, it could be anything. Right. The book came out, you know, six months before uh, the pandemic Good hit. timing. And I, we, it was really odd because yeah. I think my co-author and I strongly felt like there was some massive sense of urgency that we needed to finish it. Neither of us could have anticipated it, right? But and of course, the subtitle says "Build Resilience Before Disruption Hits." I may change that on the yeah. second edition because, you know, what we've done since is how do we build resilience in the midst of all of this disruption? That's but, cool too. Yeah, yeah, and it, but it's possible. Right. Um, well, keep going along that line of thinking. Okay. So, from what I've just like learned, resilience is building resilience and dealing with disruption could be something internal like. Uh, restructuring because there's growth in an organization, or maybe we want growth to be in a certain direction. Obviously, it can be all of these things that are that are on the outside that are forces that are acting on the business itself. So of those things, what tends to be like the more difficult to deal with? And, and can you give me like, is there like a of course, there are many steps and there are many things to do, but is there like a, a Jennifer plan of here's the yeah. here's the things that we do? Walk me through what that looks like. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So well, I'll tell you how the book is divided up. And this is really the Jennifer plan, right? Good. So, Good. Um, so here's the interesting thing. And this is what I had to learn when I started researching resilience and really understanding um, this notion of resilience. So first of all, can it be built? The answer is yes. The problem is many people think the only way we build resilience is by going through a bunch of tough stuff, you know, and then we sort of get beat up and we figure it out. And that applies to individuals and organizations. But the challenge with that is that some people get beat up and they get tougher. Some people get beat up and they just kind of fall out right. and they don't make it. Right. So the answer, you know, to me, well, maybe not the answer, but the next question was what separates those who get energized and elevated and get better at this thing called going through disruption from those who, you know, just kind of fall out and, you know, they go through a bunch of tough stuff and five years later they're on public assistance and, you know, collecting disability. And, and that's no joke. I mean, I have friends wow. in that, in that situation that went through very similar things that I went through. And that was really my first big aha in this space. And so the way the book is divided up is the first half is all about building individual resilience. Now, what we know is that the characteristics of resilient people and organizations are the same. Okay. And so what that means is that we can teach it the exact same way. Now we might use different words. For example, if you talk about your core beliefs as an individual, that may come down to your faith, that may come down to you know, your religion or whatever you stand for from that standpoint in an organization that might be your mission or your vision or your values or, you wow. know, the principles that your organization stands for. But the reality is it's the same thing and it has the exact same impact. So we do a half the book on individual so we can really teach people how to really understand the depth of this work because it is deep. It is edgy. It is not easy, right. um, but once you understand how to do it, you can take the same exact framework and apply it to the organization and the team. Love it. And so in the book, there is a framework. And so this is the plan. So the framework is really, um, first, we, we walk you through a section to think about your filters. So these are the things that um, filters are, the ways you view the world okay. that were shaped by your attitudes, your experiences, your beliefs, your background, all of that. It can be unconscious biases, but we ask you to kind of let's think about those so that we become more conscious of them because many of them are unconscious. 
And then we look at resilience uh, and we say it, it really is a result of your mindset and the choices that you make. And underlying those two things is a set of core beliefs. Hmm. Now, mindset is a function of how authentic are you able to be in the environment you're in and your attitude. So choosing your attitude as you go into different situations. And then your choices are a function of your purpose. And that I don't necessarily mean your purpose in life, but like your purpose in a situation and then how you define success. And of course, underlying that is this notion of core beliefs. And those are things that when it is time to stand up, when things get tough, you've got to have a foundation to be able to stand on. If you don't have that foundation, it's very difficult to stand up. We don't espouse any particular belief system. It doesn't matter to me whether you know that your rabbit's foot is guiding you or yeah. it's God or whatever. Right. I, I know exactly what's true for me. And what's important is that you know what's true for you. Right. And so I certainly share probably more about that in a corporate workshop than any other you know, uh, leaders that I know. But it's more of a, uh, let me show you how this works when can, you get it right. Can we talk about that for one second? Because that, that's exactly <laughs> sure. what I was thinking as you were, you were saying it. Like what percentage, and I'm not looking for a number, but you know, like how many of these leadership types, C-suite that you're working with, you know, don't maybe have the core beliefs and values. And that's a little startling, maybe even to them. Talk, talk about that for just a minute, because I love what you said. I never thought about, you know, your mission statement with your business, you know, kind of equating to mm -hmm. your personal values and, and mission statement in your life. So talk about that for just a minute. What do you see when you go in there yeah. and, and you start dealing with these folks? Well, this is always an area where we have to tread a bit lightly, right? right. And and I don't, and I'm not a very light treader. Right? <laughs> so, um, so we we have a reputation for kind of going right to the edge, and then hopefully we don't go over the edge. But I really push people. So one of the things that's it's in the book, and we use it in our workshops. We have a checklist of here are some things that you need to know, and you need to circle the ones where you're unclear. And there are things like where do you go when you die when you die? How do the flowers grow? Is there a higher power? You know, there, there are certain things that- Dang, that's, if, uh, that's edgy in the corporate world because they, oh, they, right? they must be thinking like, why does this matter? What does this matter at all to yeah. whether or not, you know, our company's going to survive this disruption, right? I mean, do you ever, do you ever it, get pushback like that? Well, usually by the time I get there, they know exactly why it matters okay. because what happens is when things get tough, and you need to stand up. If you don't have something to stand on, it is incredibly difficult hmm. to be resilient. And here's the thing. If you, if what you stand on is vastly different from what the organization is going to stand on, then here's the thing about resilience. Resilience is a lot about, um, it's very similar to like a gas tank. So you have gas in the tank and you use the gas, you know, every day doing what you're doing, you know how much gas you use. But in the event of disruption, you're going to be asked to use extra gas, right. extra discretionary energy, if you right. will. If someone doesn't have any extra discretionary energy in the tank, they're never going to be able to be resilient. Right. So the way you build discretionary energy is not wasting the gas on things that don't matter. So if you're sitting in an organization that has vastly different values than you do, or worse, you're in an organization that says they have a certain set of values, but when it comes time to making business decisions, they don't use those values. There's this like dissonance, this discomfort, this disorienting dilemma that sucks the energy out of your tank. So when you need discretionary energy, it's not there. Yeah. So if we're asking people to be resilient, not as organizations, which is what we've been doing, it's not enough to just say, oh, go pull out this discretionary energy. You've got to make sure that they have the mechanism where that energy is being sucked out of the tank while they're, you know, say, hiding an image. Yeah. Or they somebody comes to work. Here's, you know, the book also presents this notion of derailers of resilience. Things like power struggles. Things like, you know, I don't feel like I can really be myself at work. If I'm a minority that's persecuted at work or I don't get the credit I deserve or I'm in some kind of a power struggle because of something I can't control, I'm going to spend more of that discretionary energy dealing with that right. rather than dealing with 
the real issue that the company needs me to deal with. Right. So we have to make sure that people have the ability to put that energy back in the tank. Yeah. And so if, if you don't know what your core beliefs are, and all of a sudden we're asking you to really step up and be resilient, it's tough. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. really, really difficult. So when we talk about that, I mean, and I don't, I don't hit it lightly in a corporate workshop, we may not ask people to necessarily share all of those if they're not comfortable, but we certainly give them the exercise and, and tell them, you know, that we make sure that they understand they need to do the work. Right. Um, we right. usually do that in smaller groups. Yeah. They get time right. to work on it. You know, we tread carefully, but we don't shy away from it. That is, is uh, and, that's and deep end, stuff. This work is deep. Yeah. But in the end, I can take a company in a 16 hour workshop and literally make progress on making that leadership team and that company more resilient. And we've done it time and time again. Yeah. 16 hours is nothing yeah. if you think about the cost of some of this. Yeah, no doubt. Well, congratulations. I, I love it. Uh, as I'm listening to this, you know, I'm, I'm flying out next. No, I'm flying out this week to California. I'm in Florida now since the pandemic. You know, we shut our California offices down because they closed us up. And so now we're oh, a virtual okay. company, which is cool okay. because what a blessing for me. But we so we do uh, team meetings, you know, a couple of times a year where we bring the whole mm -hmm. kind of core team together. And I'm like, I am totally going to be talking about this stuff. I love it. I love I love the whole idea. I mean, I, obviously, I need to dive uh, back into your book, but I love the whole idea of, you know, I mean, first of all, we didn't even talk about this, but if people are going through personal difficulties, then, oh, then their resilience tank is going to be low, right? Yeah. And, and so that is another issue that if people don't have their personal values and a good, strong foundation personally then of yeah. course they're not going to have anything left in the tank to give to the company either. So so you're right. you're helping the individual to mm -hmm. have a better life, not only the, the company oh. have a better life, which is awesome. I have to tell you the most shocking. So when we wrote the book, we were incredibly clear on who was our target audience. It was corporate leaders, director in a book. And I was shocked. So some of the first people to read the book you know, one was in an academic institution, one was a housewife, one was a hairstylist. And these people wrote what one sent me pictures of the book with post-it notes on every wow. page, highlighted yeah. notes in the margins, the whole thing. And I was flabbergasted. Another one wrote me a review and said, I thought I was picking up a book, but this book changed my whole life. Wow. I mean, we have had. I love it. It has been. And I, I never I never anticipated that. And we've had, you know, the first time we did the two-day workshop, I had, you know, people in tears, people, these massive breakthroughs were happening. And as a program leader, I mean, I really was ill-equipped to deal with it at yeah. the beginning. I mean, now I'm like, oh, okay, that's coming. Yeah, this so is now what's supposed know, to happen. Yeah. Now I know. <laughs> but I remember at the beginning, I was like, oh, is this good or is this bad? Like, I don't know. <laughs> They're but, all breaking down. <laughs> they're breaking, right? But but then what happened was really strange. So in that particular first group, which is, you know, I think the first one's always the one that's like near and dear to your heart. I had their CIO called me. One of his people was in the room and he called me a couple of days later and he said, what did you do to one of my employees? I've been trying to get through to him for wow. five years and he's finally come around. Yeah. And then I... It's funny. I talked to one of the people in that room a couple days ago and I hadn't talked to her. It was, this was like three years ago. I hadn't talked to her in three years and we get on the phone and, and I said, Oh, how are you doing? And now I will say she was in the front of the room when we did the program and she had this grumble <laughs> scowl on her face, like obviously very skeptical. Right. Um, right. I, I wasn't sure I'd ever win her over. And, you know, she said to me a couple days ago, she said, Oh my God, I'm so glad to see you. She said, not a day has gone by in three years when I haven't used your content. Wow. And I was like, I mean, my jaw was on the floor. I was like, really? And so, of course, I asked her, you know, what did she use and all of this? And, you know, but doing work like that, I think has just, it's made me really laser-like focus on what is really, really important. Yeah. Especially during the pandemic. Yeah. You know, and, and we even built a, and we haven't had that many people download it, but we have a five-step. I shouldn't admit that, but it is true. We have sort of a, a five-step, you know, COVID, like after COVID re-engagement program. 
but it's all about what you just said. It's mm. all about how do I know where my people's heads are yeah. and how do I make sure that they're actually okay and they're able to be resilient. Right. So, you know, that I think is really critical. Yeah. You know, I, I took a flight out in November to a mastermind conference and I always, I'm a little old school. I, I grab a book and I, a book that I haven't read in a while or a book that I've never read. And I just read the book and I just think, and, and it was a little known book on uh, Napoleon Hill and, and his various mm. principles. And, and the first principle he talked about was um, definitiveness of purpose, which I, definitiveness, it's not even a word that we seem to use in this day and age anymore. But It's a good you know, one, though. Yeah, it is. Uh, your definite purpose. And uh, mm-hmm. I spent five hours thinking about that. And one of the things that I came up with, because it, it starts broad and then it, it narrows, you know, the, the idea starts broad about your purpose, but then narrows into the way to think about it and, and even creates like this... Uh, internal faith, if you will. And Mm -hmm. one of the things that I thought about and decided was, you know, I have uh, employees that have been with me for 10 years, which, you know, we're a small, very small business, but that even to me seems kind of extraordinary to have a, you know, a small business with a couple dozen employees and have employees that are six years, seven years, 10 years that have been with us. And I thought, you know, I believe they're happy with us. And, and we talk about that. And I think that that's why they've stayed. But like, I, I want them to do well in their life. Like, I want to help them reach their goals, whatever that looks like. That was one of the things that I kind of personally came up with. Because it is, it has, it's certainly more, we're, we're more a team than a family. Uh, family you can't get rid of, team members that you know you can, but I don't want to get rid of any of them. I want to see them flourish oh. and succeed. And and this is kind of the same idea, yeah. but it even takes it to a another level of depth, which I, I really like. I can't wait to dive back into your book after a couple of years and and, <laughs> and I'll be reading it on my flight out to California before my meetings. So thank you. Thank you for that. You're very welcome. Yeah. And if there's anything I can do, I mean, by all means, like if we need to get them for your team or whatever, I'm happy to happy Love to it. help because that it really is, you know, it like any book, I guess, right? You can just read the book and okay, I've read a book. But yeah. if you do the exercises and you really internalize it and you really think about it, I think that's when it really, you start to see the power of it. Yeah. And, you know, when we started this, like first it was a keynote and then the keynote became a workshop and the workshop became the book. And, you know, I remember back to that, you know, that first group that went through the workshop, I, I called their CEO, you know, several months after the program and I said, you know, okay, so you put your top 15 people through this, you know, what's changed? And of course, the minute you ask that question, it's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> what if he says nothing, right? Yeah. What am I going to do? Yeah. And uh, his answer to me was something I'll never forget. He said, you know, Jennifer, um, because 15 people went through that program, our entire company has more courage. Wow. And I thought, you know, this was when I met them, they were a, a conglomeration. They were, they had acquired seven companies. The seven companies didn't really know each other. They were all over the world from, you know, Minneapolis to Australia to Singapore. They were everywhere. Wow. Different time zones. They didn't talk. They didn't really know each other. They hadn't really integrated. But as a result of that program, they really came together. And, you know, we created this fantastic, of course, it was in person. So we created this, although I will say even not in person, we've converted the workshop to virtual and we're getting just a good feedback. Yeah. Oh, we're getting, I can't believe the feedback we're getting. You have to do it differently, Yeah. but it has the same, same feedback. And the feedback I get is it's the relationships that people build, you know, while they're going through this work, because it is so personal, but then we're able to take it and focus it on the organization. Right. You know, and in that particular case, they got this group of people that really didn't know each other together. And when we started talking about the organization, they decided that what the way the CEO was talking about the new company really was not in alignment with their values. And so they had a very altruistic, all of them were very mission driven. And he was talking about how they were going to increase profitability by bringing all these, you know, pieces together. And we actually staged a conversation at the end where we brought the CEO in, you know, and these 15 people said, this is not okay. Yeah. And they changed the way they market. And I will tell you, that is a company that was highly impacted. They're in the education, church, community center kind of space, very social mission, majorly affected by COVID. They didn't miss a beat. Wow. I mean, they did, they're they doing better today than they were two years ago. I love it. It's I love it. Unreal. Yeah. 
Well, everyone is hearing all the reasons to get the book. Let's let's shift gears for just a second. And let's talk a little bit about what the book has done for you and what the book has done for your business. I think what the book has done to help other people, clear, amazing. Uh, how are you using your book? And you know what are the results that you've seen as far as opportunities, new clients, that kind of thing uh, from the use of your book? Yeah, that I mean, that's an interesting question, because I've always felt like we were a little lazy on marketing. We didn't really have the best plan when we started. And so, you know, I very much felt like we never did the right thing. Yeah. But what the book has, you know, what I did do was we sent the book to everyone we could think of that might have an appetite for this work or, you know, worked in a, a senior level in a company that might be interested. And strangely, I mean, the book it did a number of things. First, it connected me back with people that I hadn't talked to in years. Yeah. So former clients, you know, people we used to work with got the book and I got many, many calls just from, you know, oh, hey, wow, you wrote a book. This is great. You know, I don't think they had even read it at that point, but it right. was like, oh, well, let's get back in touch. That generated, believe it or not, a ton of really significant engagements. So yeah. whether it was a workshop or a coaching engagement or you know, just, hey, we want to get back in touch and we start the conversation. But I would call that a win from the standpoint of, you know, did we sell enough books to pay for the book? Probably not. But one workshop paid for the book. Exactly. So, you know, <laughs> it's like yeah. from that standpoint, if you look at it that way, I mean, yeah. it, you know, it really it really increased our exposure. It started I subcontract coaching to a premium firm and, you know, they give the book to their clients. I, you know, I give the book to my clients. It cemented us as, you know, credible yeah. in a topic that's incredibly relevant. Now, the irony of that was I just I just got with another company to see if we could get it put in like airport bookstores. And they said, oh, no, no, we can't do that. It's two years old. And I went, who's not? Like, yeah, but who's not talking about resilience right now? Yeah. Um, so it was kind of funny, but okay, that's all right. But I think, you know, if more than anything, I felt like resilience is the number one skill of leaders today. And for years, I said, no one's talking about it. Well, now they're talking about it, but they're, they don't know what to do about it because right. there's absolutely nothing out there that tells you how to build a more resilient organization. Yeah. I mean, there's... A hundred books on resilience written by people that survived cancer, were hit by sure. a bus, hit by a truck, climbed Mount Everest. I mean, whatever it is. But there's nothing to say, how do I make my corporate team more resilient? And this book does that. And yeah. so that yeah. has given us, you know, it's generated revenue from a coaching standpoint, a workshop standpoint. And we use it mostly, I hate to say this, but we use it mostly as a, you know, we've got a new client we're talking to. Hey, you want me to send you a book while I'm at it? Yeah. <laughs> That kind of helps us. Of course. Of course. Well, you know, I, I love, look, what you said is simple, but even most people don't do it. The first thing you did with your book was you sent it to all past clients, current clients, you know, potential clients, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And that generated, it sounds like many coaching engagements, workshops, and, and things where people were writing you large checks. Who cares? In one sense, who cares if a 100,000 people buy it and don't act on it? But if 10,000 people get it in their hands through any source, through you, yeah. and then actually act on it and write you big checks, have you out to speak, and like make significant changes in their organizations because of your work, that's the real impact. You know, that's, yeah. that's the income and, and the impact of, of, uh, yeah. of a best-selling book. So, yeah, I mean. And I, I mean, I had a woman, I, she interviewed me as a coach kind of right after the book came out. She chose another coach. She chose one of my colleagues. He's fantastic. I don't begrudge her a thing. Yeah. But I sent her the book in the process, and we are now about to do a major speaking engagement and the workshop and a bunch of coaching for the team of her, her leadership team above her. This is a Fortune, you know, 112 ish company. Wow. Um, you know, that will probably lead to more workshops where we're, we're going to try to help them quantify what is the cost of not being resilient in your organization. There will be, you know, 35 leaders of that company in the room. I have no doubt we'll sell a handful of workshops from that. Yeah. You know, it's just, I think the book's been invaluable. Not to mention, I mean, the message in the book is sort of, you know, it is the message that I personally said, you know, 
I can't die until this book is written because awesome. that is the message that only I can deliver. Now my co-author had a big part in it. Yeah. I don't want to take away credit from her, but this message was the one I wanted to leave the world with. Yeah. And so, you know, hopefully there'll be other messages one day, but this one yeah. is the one that really, really mattered to me. So the more people that read it, that see it, that when I see a client or a friend with all the pages folded down and the post-it notes and everything, I just, it just makes me, you know, it gives me all the warm and fuzzies inside. I love it. I love it. Well, look, congratulations. Congratulations on writing a really impactful book. <laughs> congratulations on, you know, the rewards that have come from it as well for, for you and, and your company. So where can people learn more about you? Let's give them some links and let them know where where they can, obviously they can get the book on Amazon, but let's send them directly to your website, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. Our website is uh, www.leadershiftinsights.com. So that's not leadership, it's leadership. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> leadershiftinsights.com. Um, there's all the information you'd ever need on me, the book, the consulting we do and all of that. Yeah. The book is in a section under, I think it's called knowledge base. So, and it says resilience book. Yeah. So it's pretty obvious uh, that it's there and certainly it's available on Amazon as well. But that's probably the best way to you know learn more about us. And, and we certainly would welcome any any inquiries. We're on Facebook, LinkedIn, all those things. But uh, I think LinkedIn is uh, LinkedIn slash Eggers. And then uh, Facebook is uh, there's Jennifer Eggers or Jennifer Eggers speaker. And, you know, we certainly would love the interaction, would love to hear what you're struggling with and happy to strategize with any of your listeners. Love it. Love it. Jennifer, thank you. Thanks for being on today. And uh, congrats again on all the success. Thank you. I appreciate it. This has been a pleasure. I've been wanting to uh, do this for a couple of years. So I don't know. I don't I don't know how we were remiss in not getting to you sooner. But boy, it was really great to reconnect. <laughs> same. Same. Thank you. Hey, thanks for listening in on the Publish, Promote, Profit podcast. If you enjoyed it, please take a minute and like and subscribe to the podcast because every week I bring you either great guests or great teaching to help you to grow your income and your impact with a best-selling book. And if you're interested in having your own best-selling book, check out my short video which explains our trademark process at beginmybook.com.